A while ago I made a video about what makes a mystery box story. I outlined 10 things a story needs to do to be a good mystery box. Well in this series, I'm reviewing every mystery box story I know, going down the list and checking off how many they each get right. Then at the end I can give them a rating out of 10, to show how good a mystery box it is. This episode I'm checking out the shortest ever mystery box story, Over the Garden Wall. Over the Garden Wall is a 10-episode miniseries on Cartoon Network. It was created by Patrick McHale and premiered in 2014. It was part of what some call the Cartoon Network Renaissance, where in the 2010s the network saw a huge boom in high-quality serialized animation. This was a time where shows like Adventure Time and Steven Universe were giving kids complex, emotionally intelligent storytelling while also staying light and fun. Over the Garden Wall is ostensibly made for kids, but even though it looks cute and happy on the surface, it also has one of the darkest tones of any children's show around. The show follows two brothers, Wirt and Greg. Wirt is the mature, if neurotic, older brother, while Greg is young and naive with his head in the clouds. The two of them wander through a fantastical fantasy world called The Unknown, which is full of strange creatures, some friendly, some not. Before I get to analyzing, I want to do something that I don't normally do and tell you to go watch the show if you haven't already. It's 10 episodes that are 10 minutes long. The whole show is shorter than most movies. It was on Hulu, now it's on HBO Max, it might be on Cartoon Network's website too, and it's absolutely worth watching through. I wouldn't say this if I didn't think it was great, short, and easy to watch. I wanted to make this recommendation before I spoil the entire thing. Number 1. Start with one huge obvious mystery. The show opens with Wirt and Greg talking about how they're lost. Uh, Greg? I think we're lost. We, we, sh we should have left a trail or something. I can leave a trail of candy for my pants. Wirt wants to get back home as soon as possible, but Greg doesn't care. He's happy to wander and see where the world takes him. Soon they come across the Old Grist Mill, where an old woodsman warns them of the dangerous monster known as the Beast. The brothers fight with what they think is the Beast, but... Put up that turtle and now he's my new best friend! Oh! Oh! We, we got the Beast problem solved. The dog! That is not the beast! By the end of the first episode, we barely learn anything about what the beast is or what it wants. But it's there, lurking in the background for the whole show. That's our opening mystery. What other smaller mysteries are there? There's the old woodsman, who definitely knows more than he's saying and has some kind of skeleton in his closet. Another character who has secrets is Beatrice, the talking bird who agrees to help the brothers find a way home. There are these black turtles that show up everywhere. And Wirt keeps whining about getting his heart broken, but we have no idea what that's about. Further and further, drifting away from where I want to be, who I want to be. In the meantime, every episode has its own little mystery that gets resolved within 10 minutes. In episode 2, Wirt, Greg, and Beatrice stumble on a town full of pumpkin people, and they aren't sure if they're friend or foe. Turns out, friend. In episode 3, they visit a school, and there's some gorilla running around scaring people, which turns out to be the teacher's ex, Scooby-Doo style. In episode 5, they hang out at a rich guy's mansion that seems to be haunted, but it's just another lady whose own mansion is attached to his. In episode 7, they meet a girl named Lorna, who's kept prisoner by a creepy woman named Ansie Whispers. But their situation isn't what it seems. Any episodes I didn't mention are dedicated to the medium-sized mysteries. In episode 4, we learn more about what the beast is and why it's dangerous. Through song. Wirt flows to the theory that the woodsman might really be the beast. Wait, wait, lantern? The woodsman was the guy with the weird lantern, not the beast. Huh? <gasps> Beatrice, you're turning into an Adelwood tree. You were the beast all along. But then we finally get a glimpse of the real beast, and we learn that the woodsman is working for it because his daughter's spirit is trapped inside the lantern. But be sure to keep it lit, or your daughter's flame will go out. Forever. Wirt talks about his recent heartbreak. So then what? Well, 
Then I went to go talk to Sarah. I mean, like, really talk to her, you know? Put all my cards on the table, you know? Yeah. And then Jason Funderburger comes out of nowhere and whisks her away. Ugh, Jason Funderburger, that guy. As for Beatrice, we learned that she used to be a human before she threw a rock at a bird and got her whole family cursed. You used to be human? Did I know that? I, I don't think I knew that. Jiminy Cricket, let's just find some coins, all right? Fine, I threw a rock at a bluebird and it cursed me and my family and now we're all bluebirds. Happy? She leads the brothers to the witch Adelaide, because apparently she can send the brothers home and lift Beatrice's curse. But in episode 6 on the frog ferry to Adelaide's house, Beatrice is clearly having second thoughts about something. Our journey is finally over. Pretty soon I'll be back home. Huh, Beatrice? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. So, where's Adelaide's house? Is it close? It's... hmm. We should probably just go tomorrow, I think. We don't want to bother her too late, you know? Then when they get to Adelaide's, they find out that Adelaide isn't there to help them. She's there to capture them. Beatrice was leading them there to trade them for a cure to her curse. Our arrangement was for you to bring me a child servant, and then I give you the scissors. To snip, snip, snip your family's wings away to make them human again. But it doesn't work, and the boys escape. That was a lot easier than Lost. There are plenty of mysteries, but are they interconnected? Eh. I could be generous and say that all the mysteries fall under the umbrella of what's the deal with the unknown, but on a practical level, they're pretty isolated. The single episode mysteries don't exactly lead into one another, and the two bigger mysteries, Beatrice and the Beast, have nothing to do with each other except for this one line that doesn't go anywhere. I do as he commands, the voice of the night, the beast of eternal darkness. Number four is where we hit a bigger snag. To be a mystery box, the audience has to know that there are mysteries in the first place. And Over the Garden Wall is at a huge disadvantage here because it is a cartoon. What do I mean by that? Well, cartoons by nature present an exaggerated reality. In a live-action show like Lost, you see weird, unexplained stuff and immediately recognize that it's out of place, mysterious. In a cartoon, you see something totally crazy like, say, a group of frog musicians, and you just roll with it because that's how cartoons are. In this made-up world, it's hard to know what's normal and what's not. The only way you know that something's supposed to be a mystery in a cartoon is if the show overtly draws your attention to it. But in that department, Over the Garden Wall isn't doing itself any favors. From the first moment, the show just kind of throws you into it with very little exposition besides Greg and Wirt are brothers who are lost. The Beast and some of the other smaller mysteries are explicitly called attention to, but the bigger questions that would make this work as a mystery box story are not. Who are the brothers? Where did they come from? How did they get here? Why are they dressed like that? Where did the frog come from? What is the unknown? There is no indication that the story will ever interrogate these questions. It would be fair to assume that their situation is just baked into the premise, and you're supposed to accept it and move on, even though they do end up being important questions. I want to emphasize, though, that this is not a criticism of the show's writing. These criteria are to help decide how well a story fits into the genre of Mystery Box. They have nothing to do with the quality of the writing. In fact, leaving these questions unasked plays a huge role in setting up the creepy, unmoored atmosphere of the story. No, it's not long. I already called it the shortest Mystery Box story ever. It clocks in at less than two hours, and that severely hamstrings its ability to develop a sprawling web of questions. And as for the way the mysteries are paced, well, the Beast makes an appearance about once every three episodes, and we learn more about it each time. This mystery is built up masterfully, but as for the rest of it, not so much. This ties back to number four. In a mystery box story, the questions need to build on each other, with each answer leading to more questions. If you don't know what questions you're supposed to be asking, that can't happen. This leads to a backloading of plot points onto the last two episodes, which I'll get to in a bit. But first... Alright, so what mystery box tropes show up here? There's no literal mystery box, no secret organizations, and no time travel. There is a monster lurking in the shadows. The Beast. Duh. Even when he shows up in full, we only ever see his silhouette and his eyes. That's part of the reason why he's maybe the scariest kids show character in recent memory. I mean, I wasn't scared. And that's a raw fact. But it's easy to see why he would really freak out a younger viewer. And the guy who knows all the answers but only drops hints every so often? That's the woodsman. But it's not his fault he's so unhelpful. Wart and Greg keep beating him up and running away before he can tell them anything important. Huh? Greg, why did you do that? That was your plan, remember? Knock him out. Uh, no, the bad plan. I told you to forget that plan. 
and the show makes great use of nonlinear storytelling, as you'll soon see. So the first seven episodes are pretty good, but it's the final three that push the show into greatness. In episode eight, Wirt, shaken from Beatrice's betrayal, loses all confidence. He's supposed to protect his brother, but he has no idea what he's doing. Seeing this, Greg decides to try stepping up to lead them out of danger. They stop to sleep during a snowstorm, and Greg gets pulled into this cutesy dream world. He asks them to help him become a good leader. But this dream world was actually created by the Beast. It shows Greg, Wirt starting to transform into an Edelwood tree. And Greg, because he wants to take charge, offers himself in exchange. When Wirt realizes what happened, he runs after Greg, but falls into a frozen pond and is saved by Beatrice. Then, episode 9 flashes back. And we find out that Wirt and Greg are actually from the real world, like a regular average American town. We get the story of how Wirt tried to give the girl he likes, Sarah, a tape confessing his feelings, but Greg tried to bring it to her before he was ready. That led to a series of events that end with them both falling into a river and ending up in the unknown. From there we get answers to all the questions we didn't know we needed. Why are they dressed the way they are? Because it's Halloween. Oh, look at you! What are you supposed to be? It's an elephant costume. <laughs> See my trunk? Why does Greg have pants full of candy? I was helping old lady Daniels rake some leaves in exchange for candy. Greg, it's Halloween. Candy is free. Where did the frog come from? So you want to go look for frogs with me like you said you would a while ago and haven't done it yet? <laughs> we found our lucky frog. And the rock? Oh, hey, and look, I also got this rock. Hey, Wirt, want to learn some rock facts? Why is the show called Over the Garden Wall? Really? Get down from that wall. Oh, darn it. No. I mean, come down this way. And maybe most importantly, we find out why Wirt is so hard on Greg the whole show. He's mad at him for interfering with his attempt to ask out Sarah. Or rather, his attempt to chicken out of asking out Sarah. During the episode, he keeps trying to get his tape back, give up, and let Jason Funderburger ask her out. Despite the obvious signals that Sarah is into him and not Jason. Wait, you're here. Well, I... I was just asking if you were here. Hey, Sarah. Are you ready to go? You coming, Wirt? No, no. You, you go. Have fun with Jason Funderburger. Okay. But if you want to stop by later or something... Mm, bye, Wirt. Greg's actions keep propelling him forward to Sarah, and Wirt keeps blaming Greg on failures that are obviously self-inflicted. You can hang out with Sarah more. That ship has sailed, Greg. Thanks to you messing that up, too. This is also where we get the first big signs that the unknown might not be real. The most obvious is the fact that the brothers fell into a river. The implication is that they're unconscious, in a shared fantasy, as they're nearly drowning. As the show goes on, the unknown gets colder and colder, because the freezing water is slowly killing them. There are smaller things, too. Like the band poster for the Black Turtles in Wirt's room, or the grave with the name Quincy Endicott, the rich guy from episode 5, or even the unknown's name. Into the unknown. This would be a good time to address criteria number 7. Whether the unknown is real or not, it doesn't matter. It's all still diegetic. Wirt and Greg interact with it. It feels real to them. Even the dream world from episode 8, which is like a dream within a dream at this point, is diegetic. The beast made it, and Greg later makes decisions because of what he saw inside of it. Remember that diegetic means that it exists in the story world. Real or not, this is all part of the story. For an example of something that's non-diegetic, there's the opening shot of the frog playing piano. This isn't part of the story, it's just a fun visual. It's perfectly clear that all the important stuff is diegetic. In the final episode, Wirt and Beatrice track down Greg, but by the time they do, the Beast has almost fully claimed him. And we finally get confirmation of something we suspected but never knew for sure. The Edelwood Trees are the trapped souls of dead children. I didn't know! I didn't know this was where the Edelwood Trees came from! The Beast offers to put Greg's soul in the lantern, just like the Woodsman's daughter, and he tells Wirt that he can harvest trees to keep the lantern lit and keep Greg's soul alive. But Wirt realizes that there's something off about that offer. I'm trying to help you. You're not trying to help me. You just have some weird obsession with keeping this lantern lit. It's almost like your soul is in this lantern. Wirt frees Greg and gives the lantern back to the woodsman, who finally ends the cycle of the beast and the lantern keeper. She was never in the lantern, was she, beast? <laughs> <laughs> 
Listen, Woodsman. Listen to me. No, Woodsman! Wirt and Greg climb out of the river and are taken to a hospital, where they reunite with their fellow kids. And Wirt finally gets with Sarah. I don't have a tape player, so... Uh, yeah. So, maybe we can listen to this? You can listen to it at my house. Yes. You would think that this is final confirmation that the unknown wasn't real. But, as Greg is telling everybody about their adventures, the frog's belly glows. Just like when he swallowed the bell in episode 7. So this ending wraps up a lot. It leaves ambiguous whether or not the unknown was all a dream. And the one little mystery that it leaves hanging is the black turtles. We never find out what they are exactly, presumably they're connected to the Edelwood trees, but that's all we got. Everything else though, it's all explained. Not that there is much to explain, because again, it's so short that there aren't that many mysteries in the first place. The mysteries were also set up in advance. I mean, how could they not be? The show was, I assume, written all at once. There are plenty of cool details early on that give you hints about later plot points. Like the shot of the woodsman and his daughter in the opening sequence. I especially like all the little clues that Beatrice is lying. She impatiently breezes past important information in a very blasé way. The first time through, you assume that that's how she normally talks, but on a rewatch, it seems so obvious. Thanks, I owe you a favor. So, um, you two are lost kids with no purpose in life, right? I can't leave. I'm honor bound to help you since you guys helped me. That's the bluebird rules. My brother's name is Wirt. Who cares? How about you and I ditch your brother? What about the favor? I'll think of my wish later. Ugh. Is that why you're going to Adelaide? To fix things? That was the plan, but... <sighs> yeah, that was the plan. Finally, does Over the Garden Wall get so bogged down in creepy, weird, unexplained stuff that it forgets to have good characters? No, it has awesome characters. I'm a big fan of Wart in particular. He's my favorite character archetype. The anxious, logical, book-smart guy who keeps getting dragged into ridiculous situations. His banter with Beatrice is awesome, and I really appreciate that they didn't try to make her into a, like, a love interest or something. Even though she's a bird, a lesser show would have tried to push a half-baked love story onto them. It's stuck. Well, guess we have to spend some quality time together. HELP! And every line that comes out of Greg's mouth is pure gold. And please don't call me old lady! Yes sir, young man! But besides that, Wirt has an awesome arc. He starts out blaming everything on Greg and constantly putting him down. He's incapable of taking responsibility for his own success and his own happiness. You're always messing up, Greg. Boy! You have it backwards! You are the elder child! You are responsible for you and your brother's actions! At first, you assume that this attitude rolls off Greg's back, but by the end, we see that he took Wirt's feelings to heart. Greg tries and fails to take responsibility onto himself. This is just gut-wrenching to see. Usually, a character like Greg is immune to any danger whatsoever. Seeing him in a state like this is devastating. But Wirt finally learns that he is capable of taking care of them both, if he can get out of his own head. He saves Greg, and in the final scene of the hospital, he's brimming with confidence. He's like a totally different person. As we wrap up, here are a few of my favorite things from the show. The soundtrack. The music in this show is a huge part of what helps it nail the balance of funny and creepy. This exchange. Um, Beatrice, why are you pretending I'm this guy's nephew? We need money. You're scamming him? I was thinking more like flat out stealing from him. What? No way. Why not? We already stole a horse. Hey, guys. No, we didn't. Fred's a talking horse. He can do whatever he wants. I want to steal. All the reversals in the story. Nothing is ever as it seems in the unknown. Like how you assume Auntie Whispers is cruel for keeping Lorna prisoner? Keep away from my Lorna, or you shall be hastily gobbled up. But it's actually because if she doesn't, this'll happen. Unlock this door. She will devour you. What is she talking about? No! Oh, for some reason I thought that old lady was the people eater, but it was Lorna all along. It just goes to show you stuff. The phrase burglary or turts. We're burglars! No, 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 we're not. We're not. We, we just needed to get out of the rain, and, and we, we thought this place was abandoned, so... So we came here to burgle your turts. No, it's, it's not true. <laughs> and all these hilarious little lines scattered all over the place. Ah! Spank! 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 Can you 
turn me into a tiger? Um, no. I just said I'm not magical. It doesn't have to be a magical tiger. Nah, we're just gonna hang out and drink age-appropriate drinks. Like the juice? Yeah, and whatever. Age-appropriate stuff that's not illegal. I'm an egg. Yeah, everybody knows you're an egg, Rondi. Shut it, Kathleen. Whatever. Candy camouflage! <laughs> So, I wouldn't call Over the Garden Wall a full-on mystery box story. It has some key mystery box elements, but the show is more about tone and character than mystery. And I wouldn't change a thing. This is one of the greatest pieces of kids' animation in recent history, and there's a ton for adults to love as well. In under two hours, the show pushed the boundaries of animation as a storytelling medium, and I cannot overstate how good it is. Over the Garden Wall gets a final mystery box rating of 6 out of 10. Honey, eat your dirt. Mom, stop calling it dirt. What are you gonna do about it? Turn us into bluebirds again? <laughs> Mom. <laughs> now eat your dirt.